to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's unpack it. Alright, so I'll explain. So Ephesians is what we call an epistle. Now, the handout that I gave you this week is more complicated than this is going to be. The reason for that is if you ever want to go back and review these notes, there's enough here that you can understand it. But as far as the lesson goes, these are going to match up perfectly. This is going to be a lot simpler. So, what do we mean by epistle? Epistle is another word for, whoa, for letters. Now, most of the New Testament is actually letters. Like, just about everything. In fact, like, you know, like Ephesians, Galatians, all those shuns, or like Romans, is telling you who the letter is being written to. And they're all churches. It's all letters from apostles to churches. Now, that said... There's some important questions we've got to ask about epistles. So, when you have a letter, things are happening. So, for example, if I write a letter to Allison, right, I don't need to say, Dear Allison, my wife, whom I married on June 30th, 2011? 2012. Whoops. <laughs> I was testing you, but... Um, there's a shared knowledge that Allison and I have. And so in order to understand a lot of New Testament, uh, we need to figure out what that shared knowledge is. So there's three questions we need to ask for every epistle. Number one, who's the author? Right? Who's the writer? What's the background there? What are, what are so, some things that we need to know about them? And a really good question to ask is, why should we listen? Right? I mean, that's a great question to ask. Another thing is, well, who are the recipients? So what kind of people are we writing to? Because that matters as well. So, for example, if I'm writing a letter to an enemy of mine, maybe someone that doesn't like me, I'm going to be very careful with how I word things so as not to, um, you know, kind of raise up that ire that, or, or kind of widen that gulf that's already between us. If they're friends of mine, I can be very open with my speech and be very bold in the way that I challenge them. And then finally, we have, well, what history did you share? Because they have background. So, like Alice and I, she already knows that we're married. In fact, we have like our own internal language. You know, sometimes you've heard me call Allison a wife unit. And just, just weird stuff like that. And there's all kinds of, of strange background stories. Or like um, every time Allison and I <laughs> hear somebody get water in their eye, what do we say? I got water in my eye. I got water in my eye. So we have this shared knowledge. Um, all these stories and things together. So, those are the questions that we're going to answer tonight. So let's go ahead and start with who the author is. So who's the author? Da -da -da. Dude named Paul. Also known as Saul. But we'll talk about that in a minute. So, there's this Pharisee. He's, he's a Jewish kind of religious leader. The guy's like a, a religious rock star, right? So, as a Pharisee, Saul would have had like the first five books of the Bible memorized. would have known it forward and back. Uh, Saul had this really awesome teacher named Gamaliel, who was just like a really uh, very intelligent uh, guy in, in the Old Testament world that was well-known expert of the Bible. So he had this really awesome religious pedigree, but he really opposed early followers of Jesus to the point that he was helping persecute them in prison and kill them. And if you read the book of Acts, the first time Paul enters the scene, he is holding people's coats so that they can get like, spun up more to stone to death an early Christian named Stephen. Right, so they're, they're killing him with rocks. It's an assassination or a, uh, 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 almost like a guilty verdict. They're killing him in the street. And Paul's like, yo, let me hold your coat so you can throw harder. Right, so that's when Paul gets introduced to us. So how does Paul, or Saul, I should say, become the writer of most of the New Testament, especially the book of Ephesians, as we're about to find out. So, Jesus appears to Saul and gives him faith. And that's the best way I can describe it. So, Saul is on his way to another town and he has these letters uh, from basically the government, from religious leaders, giving him authority to throw people into prison and to take their property and do these things. And he's riding a horse, and Jesus like literally just knocks him out off his horse. Like this big light shines out of heaven, like blinds Paul. He falls off his horse, and Jesus is like, Paul, why, why do you persecute me? And Paul's like, who are you? And so he has this vision of Jesus, and so Jesus like boom, like brings him to faith, and like Saul is wrecked. 
Like he doesn't even talk to anybody for days. Dude doesn't eat, he's like fast, like his whole world gets turned upside down. So, later on, Jesus sends him as a missionary to non-Jews. So when you're reading the New Testament, you're going to get this word Gentiles, and Gentiles means non-Jews. Um, which doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but when we get into Ephesians like 2 and 3, we're going to learn that, hey, it actually is a big deal, this distinction between Jews and Gentiles, Jews and non-Jews. So, that said, most of us, I mean, you call him by Saul, most of us know Paul, or by Saul, by his Greek name, Paul. So, real quick fact, Jesus did not rename Saul Paul. That's actually a, a it sounds right, but... Paul well, his name, what it is, is uh, Jewish guys, I and mean, in Paul's time, because they lived in a multi-pluralistic society, or excuse me, a multi-lingual, like, uh, like they spoke different languages, they would take a Hebrew name, and they would take like a Greek Hellenistic name. So Paul is literally just the Greek version of Saul. So like, it may, I mean, that story is not like, oh, that pastor's wrong. It kind of made sense. It's one of those things that sounds right, but when you look at close inspection, it's like the dude always was called uh, Paul. Now, Jesus did rename other people in the New Testament, which is kind of why we usually go there. But his name is always Paul because, like, later in the New Testament, they'll say, oh, Paul, who, who also is named Saul. And it's not giving us his, like, Jesus name and then his old name. It's giving us his Greek name and his Hebrew name. So that said, learn a little bit more about Paul. Paul also was made an apostle. So Jesus makes him an apostle. So before we even roll into this, one thing things you got to understand is an apostle is not the same as a disciple, right? So a lot of times when you read the New Testament, especially like in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, uh, it's going to talk about Jesus' disciples. That's not talking about those 12 dudes, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and you know Peter and all these guys. It's talking about all the people that follow him. Sometimes it'll say the 12, and the 12 meaning like his like core group of disciples. Later on, Jesus makes some of them apostles, and he makes... Paul, the twelfth apostle. So what's apostle? Apostle is actually a Greek word. And it means a king's representative. It can be more than a king. It means like a high-ranking official. And this carried with it a lot of authority. So for example, let's say that uh, I was President Trump. Uh, let's say I was his apostle. Or if I was the apostle of uh, some king or queen of another country. That means that my word is as good as their word. Like, if I roll up and say, like, hey, if you don't do this, we're going to invade, or um, I basically make a decision, it's as if the king himself or this high-ranking official made the decision, said these things. So that's how big a deal that we're talking about. Now, what that doesn't mean is that the apostles are beyond the mistakes. Like, we know that they sinned. In fact, there's a place where Paul challenges another apostle named uh, Peter because he was basically like hanging out with Jews and refusing to hang out with Gentiles because he was afraid of offending some people. So it doesn't mean that they were beyond mistakes, but it does have impact for the way that we read the Bible. We'll talk about that just a minute. So only 12 people were given authority to be apostles. And what that meant was they were given authority to speak on Jesus' behalf through the Holy Spirit. So, all that to say, the New Testament, why do we listen to Paul? Why do we listen to some of these guys, right? Because Jesus didn't write this, per se, with his own hand. He did it through the Holy Spirit, through these guys who were apostles. Now, what that means for us is this, is that by Jesus' own words, we're to regard their writing as his own words, as if he wrote it himself. Because what he's saying is, through these men, I have chosen to speak. Now, they were sinful and messed up the same way that we were, Jesus can make that work. That said, if you want to know more about this, roll over to Matthew 10, which I have written on your sheet. You just read the whole book of Matthew 10. It's basically Jesus being like, yo, I'm going to send you out. I'm giving you authority to do this, authority to do this, authority to do this. There's some other passages there that help as well. And also, we have the apostles recognizing each other's writing as being God's own word. Because like, you know, Peter, in one of his books, says, like, hey, I know Paul's hard to understand, um, and you need to be careful because people twist his words like the other scriptures, he says. So he compared, he says Paul's word is elevated the same as the rest of the Bible. So that's why we should listen to Paul. Now, let's talk about who the recipients are. So who, who are we writing to? And that's an important question because can we connect with these people? Are they totally unrelated to us? So like, for example... Um, We've been in a long pandemic, right? So we've been stuck inside. Has anyone seen like a celebrity be like, man, it's so hard. 
and you know they're sitting in a multi-million dollar mansion with like three pools, a hot tub, and like a full coffee bar, and a live-in chef, and all this stuff, and you're like, I don't know what you're complaining about. <laughs> like, that man was talking about the fires in California burning down his uh, sports car. How many, how many dads went, oh, boo, dude, you know, it's just crazy. But that's a good point. It's, it's, it's hard to relate to that. So can we relate to these people? Like, you know, are we so distanced by time and culture that we'll never understand what Paul's talking about? So let's talk about them. These people are, of course, from a town or city called Ephesus. That's why it's called the Ephesians. They're from Ephesus. The same we were called Americans. We're from America. The place is massive and it's wealthy. Those are the two big things. So let me kind of plant that deep in your brain. So it's a major trading port between Asia and Rome. So ports and stuff don't matter as much to us today. Like We don't really think in those terms. But think about it like this. Think about how much money and product come through California, right? Because it's over there on the Pacific Ocean. Everything from Japan, from China, Southeast Asia, even Russia, all that stuff comes in through California's ports, right? So imagine that, but singled down to like one city where almost all this trade went through. So this place would have had been like rolling in cash. Now, it was big. More than 250,000 people, put that in perspective, that's way more than modern Knoxville. Like, you go to the city of Knoxville and walk around all day, I think it's like 160,000 people, that's it. They're going to be like 100,000 people. So we're talking very densely populated. Estimates range wildly. We're pretty sure there was more than 250,000 people. Some people thought there was upwards of close to a million. Um, we know that ancient Rome had up to a million people. So, like, just because they're ancient doesn't mean that, like, they could not have, like, big working cities. Now, that said, it's a modern city. Like, the more you read about it, the more impressive it gets. They had running water. They had public baths that were heated. Like, you would go take a bath, and the bath water was hot. Right? And we're talking about a swimming pool size, like, bathtub. Um, they had gyms where you could go work out, sports arenas, libraries, colleges, shops, entertainment. Um, one of the pictures I'm going to show you is their theater could sit 20,000 people at one time. And that was just like one, one of their theaters. So, I mean, this place was hopping. So, here's a recreation of Ephesus, kind of what we think it looks like. If you look at pictures of Ephesus today, it's like miles from the coast because there was like a river that connected to the ocean and that river silted up, so it doesn't look anything like this. But to give you an idea, like, there's a temple we're about to learn about, and it's like way over in that direction. Like, it was like miles away from the city. So this city was very large, miles across. You get the idea. Now, this is a good landmark to look at, the theater here. I'm about to show you a picture of it to kind of give you an idea. Say again? Our size of scale, like a lot of these things are bigger than the football field, which we're about to learn about. So, for example, let's take the theater. So this is not even the top of the theater. There were better pictures of it, but I couldn't get as a good a picture. But like when you see it like laid out, like people are super, super tiny. Um, but that's just kind of a good example. This guy is sitting right about in here, just on this side. So you got, you know, a one third or more, or half of it or more, it's still going up. So that's the kind of scale that we're talking about. Now as for the Ephesians, this place is like a huge center for religious activity. Um, so, think like New York City. If you're walking down the street in New York City, what kind of religious places are you going to find? Churches. You're going to find them. Say again? Probably some other weird stuff. You're going to find some weird cults and stuff, probably too. Uh, you're going to find mosques. Now, Islam had not come onto the scene yet this time. You're going to find synagogues. You're going to find like a whole lot of different stuff. And that's exactly what you're going to find in Ephesus. So, for example, the Temple of Artemis, sometimes you hear it called Diana, depending on whether or not you're using the Greek or the Roman name. It was one of the wonders of the ancient world. So, to put it in perspective, it was 225 feet wide. So, almost a football field wide and 425 feet long, which is over a football field long. And the kicker, it was over 60 feet high. Now, that's the columns. The columns in it were 60 feet high. That's not even adding the, the foundation or the roof, how high this thing was. To put it in perspective, 
this church is probably about 30 feet high if you step outside. So if you can imagine stone columns twice as tall as our church building, not even this room, but maybe step out and look at the outside of it. This place was massive, absolutely insane. Most of it was lost in an earthquake, and guess what happens when bricks and stuff fall over and people need to build houses? It's like, why would I cut my own bricks when I can just uh, go take this up or so on? <laughs> Basically, almost the entire temple is just gone today. Uh, they've tried to reconstruct like little tiny pieces of it, so if you look online, like the pictures are terrible. They did a lot of excavations uh, and found some of the old foundation stones so they can tell us how big it is. But that said, huge. They would host month-long religious festivals. Okay, we're not talking about Christmas where it's like two days. We're talking about all month. The whole city is like partying and doing all these rituals and all this crazy stuff. So, I mean, like to say that, you know, are they religious people? Yes, very much so. Now it gets a little stranger. Uh, it was home to the Roman emperor worship. So, at one point in Roman history, the Roman dictators basically said, like, yeah, I'm, I'm a god. Like, you should worship me. And so, they actually had, like, in Ephesus, it was one of the centers of this. So, they would, like, literally worship the Roman emperor. Uh, and we even have statues of, like, some of their priests and stuff that survived to this day. Also, it had a lot of practicing sorcerers. <laughs> Strangely enough. Now, let's talk about that, though. So, when you hear sorcerers in the Bible, or like witches, I'm not so sure about witches. I know for sorcerers, some sorcery is, is uh, translated as pharmakia. And pharmakia probably sounds familiar to you, because what does it sound like? Pharmacy. Pharmacy. And you'd be right. So, like, when we talk about... Like a witch doctor, kind of? Yeah, so, like, in the Old Testament, or in the, in, excuse me, in, in ancient history, when you're talking about a sorcerer, uh, basically these people would, like, mix up herbs and these potions and concoctions, and you would drink it. And you would have, I mean, just let's be honest, it would make you, uh, it would be hallucinogenic. And so you thought you were having a religious experience. You're so like, oh. drugs? Yeah. yeah, basically. They would drug you out. So, like, <laughs> you're like, you know, you're tripping. <laughs> and yeah. You're like, exactly. I talked to Zeus, man. Um, so, which actually, that's where I usually go. Someone's like, man, Christians use drugs. I'm like, well, the Bible really attaches it to witchcraft and sorcery. Now, granted, like the Bible, clearly there's use of medicine in the Bible, and medicine is a very good thing and a grace that God has given us. But as far as just like getting out of your mind to escape reality, that's not, I think, an option that Scripture gives us. Just a little side note there. But finally, it had a large Jewish synagogue. So um, it, it was a very pluralistic society. And actually that synagogue, if you read through the books of Acts, you get to see when Paul goes to Ephesus for the first time, and that's where he goes. He goes straight to the Jewish synagogue, because that was kind of like Paul did. Paul would walk into the city, he'd be like, okay, I'm going to go talk to the Jews, because, well, he was Jewish himself, he knew the way they thought, he spoke the language well. But um, he was supposed to talk to the non-Jews. Well, he does. So what he would do is he would go to the Jewish synagogue first, and he would preach for a while and try to convert them, and then he would move on to the Gentiles. Because part of it, if you think about it, Paul rolls into a city. He has nowhere to live. He doesn't know anybody. Um, he needs to get established so that he can do effective ministry. And then also, I mean, just because he was sent to non-Jews doesn't mean he's just going to ignore any opportunity to, to preach to his own people. But namely, like, he would get established, and uh, you would have Jewish converts, and they would really help him out in terms of doing ministry in the area. And that seemed to be the way that kind of Paul did things. Now, not finished with Ephesus yet. Uh, a lot of other religions also present. If you read online, there was like some Egyptian uh, uh, religions, and we don't know if came, those came later, if they were there in Paul's day, so I want to be careful, but there were other religions. Now, Temple of Artemis was 150% larger than that building and twice as tall. So if you can look at the size of the people, just imagine this on top of this, and this thing being 50% longer and 50% wider, and then you kind of got the idea of the Temple of Artemis in your head. Thing was huge. Bro. Yeah, I mean, like, they were talking, there was a statue of Diana in it, or of Artemis, and I used to know the dimensions. I couldn't find it again when I was going through this, but just the statue was, like, colossal. So one thing we've got to get out of our head is that ancient peoples were not as intelligent as we are, or they didn't build as impressive things. In fact, there are some things that they built that we're just like, we're not really quite sure how they did this. Um, of course, they didn't do it with magic. They had a lot of manpower and other things, but you know, we haven't had to move with big rocks in a long time without machinery. So 
<laughs> now, let's look at some other things. Ephesus, massively sexual culture. Like crazy. So, Artemis was the goddess of fertility. And I started to show you some statues. I'm just going to describe them to you. And all of the, the statues of Artemis, it's really weird. Because like basically 360 degrees around her body are breasts. There's everywhere. There's like, like dozens and dozens of them. And you, you know, first you're like, what am I looking at? And the whole idea is she's this goddess of fertility, meaning like she helps you have babies. Right? So like all these people would go and worship her. You could really... Probably a better way to put it is she's basically the goddess of sex. So like people would be like, oh, I'm, I'm having problems in the bedroom. And they go pray to, to her. Or like, I can't have children. And they go pray to her. And one of the ways they offered worship was prostitutes. So you would go to the temple, and the temple would have all these prostitutes. And you would pay your temple tax, whatever, and then you would go sleep with a prostitute. And so I think that was like part of worship? That was part of the worship. What was, the hell? <laughs> oh, oh. That was, that's not a bad word. Yeah. We'll talk about that later. But anyway, <laughs> um, the, also the city, had a, the city had a lot of brothels and they advertised them. So like this isn't some kind of seedy shack like in the back. This is like, it's like, yo, Ephesus has brothels, right? Like sailors come here. And we're going to see that. So when I say advertising, like we know, and I think I have a picture, they would carve advertisements into the streets. So, like, when you left the harbor, you could follow arrows and stuff and, like, go find the brothels. Um, and likely at the time, they probably had different things uh, also to advertise. So, directions were carved into the streets. Advertising for what you could buy. They had, like, carved images. And, you, you know, do stand there and be like, nah, I want that. And probably most interestingly, and this was across the Greek Empire, Greek prostitutes would have sandals made that had follow me imprinted into the bottom. And so when they walked on the dusty streets, you would have in Greek, follow me. And you could just follow the tracks to the brothel. Right? So we're talking about a very sexual culture. Now, you might say, like, why are you putting so much emphasis on that? And we're going to get to that. So here's a couple of them. This one, I believe, is a Greek creation, but this is actually from the streets of Ephesus. And this guy labeled it. You can't really see this, but this was basically like a lady carved in it. And then, basically, these are directions they would have understood then, right? So, like, it would have been like, okay, when you get to the crossroads, if you turn left, then there's going to be pretty ladies there. And that hole right there, I was reading about that, that was how much it cost. If you had enough coins to fill the hole, you had enough to go to the brothel. And if you didn't, you didn't need to show up. So, yeah, that's the kind of culture that we're talking about. Now, that said... Ephesus also had a very mixed society. Now by mixed, things are creeping like crazy. It's mixed socioeconomic classes. You had very, very wealthy people living next to very, very poor people. You had slaves. You had everything in between. Merchants and uh, uh, artisans, craftsmen, all these different people. Um, there were a lot of like mansion, palatial type houses in Ephesus because it was so wealthy. You had mixed races. You had Asiatic peoples, Middle Eastern peoples, like you know Jewish and among others. You had European peoples, probably people from as far as Spain. I mean, if you think about it, like the Romans controlled all the way up into Gaul, which was like uh, modern-day Britain. So, like, you had people from all over the empire making their way to this city. So this would have been just like a free-for-all in terms of uh, different cultures and races. You had mixed languages, you know, based on all these things. You had at least Greek, Latin, probably Aramaic, um, Hebrew, and a slew of others. You had mixed cultures. So all these different cultures coming to a head. Now, what is their history? So that's the question. So like, how did Paul and this place get together? So I told you that Paul eventually goes to Ephesus on one of his missionary journeys. And actually, he would stay in Ephesus and minister there longer than any other city in the New Testament. So like, he ended up spending like three years in Ephesus, and if you read a lot of Paul's missionary journeys, that just doesn't happen. Paul just like hops in, stays for a few weeks, leaves. Goes to the next place, stays for a few days, leaves. Goes to the next place, stays for a few months, leaves. That's kind of the way he operates. But he stayed a lot in Ephesus. He would stay like a year and leave and come back and stay a long time. So... Paul eventually is forced to leave. 
And this is what's wild. So he's preaching the gospel, and so many people are coming to believe in the gospel, it starts to cause socioeconomic collapse, or excuse me, just economic collapse. So what I mean is they had a very large idol industry. So they had a lot of silversmiths in the city that would make little figurines of Artemis. It was like a tourist attraction, right? I mean, like, if you lived in the ancient world and you heard about the Temple of Artemis, I mean, we heard about it today, and I would have liked to have seen it, even though I you know, it was a pagan and evil place. But people would travel to the city, and they would either buy a figurine just for kicks and giggles, or they would buy it to worship it. And, of course, you had worshipers there within the city itself. And so, so many people are starting to believe in the gospel. They hurt their business super bad, and the silversmiths guild just like threw a riot. Like it was so bad that they all drug Paul into this uh, the theater. We think it was the same theater I showed you a picture of. So imagine that place packed out with people, and they all chant for hours. Like you know, my, it was, it's kind of weird if you read it. They're all like chanting. Like my, I think it's mighty is Artemis of the Ephesians, right? And that might seem weird to you, but like imagine like if you uh, got someone in a room that disagreed with you, and everyone was just going, Jesus, 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 like while they are trying to talk, which would be a horrible thing, that would not be a Christian thing to do, but like that was their equivalent, it was just kind of chanting the name of their God, and like it was so bad that the city planner, like one of them came in, like one of the city's leaders, he's like, what is going on? And they're like, well this guy, you know, he is like turning this upside down. In fact, they, they even said that he and others like him are turning the world upside down, is what they said. Now, the city leader didn't find anything wrong with Paul, but he basically just says, he's like, dude, you need to leave. Like, this is, this is a mess. So Paul leaves uh, Ephesus. I don't think he returns after that. I don't think he does. I can't remember because it's been a while since I read through the whole story. But believers in Ephesus were likely well taught, mature, mixed big time different races, different wealth, and it worked in surrounding communities. So a lot of times when a, a letter was written to a place, it was expected that letter be copied and spread out to other communities, other smaller churches in the community. So like the idea is, like when they say the church at Ephesus, think of it like this. Think like someone said the church in Knoxville. So like the idea would be there would be the main church, the largest church in the city, and there would be all kinds of smaller churches, but the idea is that the central court for teaching or maybe meeting would be at that city. You could travel there. So, excuse me. Come on. In fact, three New Testament letters, I really should say four. Four New Testament books um, concern Paul. So three letters, or excuse me, Ephesus. Three letters in the book of Revelation. So, of course, we have Ephesians, directly written to them. Timothy was a pastor. Uh, Timothy worked with Paul, and Paul left him to pastor Ephesus. And so we have 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. And both of them are written to a pastor serving these people. And in the book of Revelation, directly addressed, as, excuse me, addresses of Ephesus um, earlier in the book. So Ephesus kind of plays a big role in the New Testament. So that is the author, that's the people, that's their history. So the so what? Why are we going through Ephesians? Like, what's, what's the point? Probably the biggest is this going to explain the spiritual work of Jesus. So like for three chapters, it's going to be this real heady, difficult to understand stuff where it's like, yo, this is what Jesus has done behind the scenes that we can't see. <clears throat> it's kind of like this. If you go watch two football teams play in the NFL at the Super Bowl, it seems so simple, right? It's just, it's just these guys showing up. But there is a mountain of activity behind the scenes. You have managers and you have trainers and you have companies building their and manufacturing and testing all their equipment. You have TV stations, and you have the whole NFL organization. You have the people that own and built the stadium. You have the cities that host it, and the police officers and different personnel that they have to have in place to get that many people in and out of that city and to maintain order. There is a lot going on, and that's kind of like Paul does. Paul's going to take the gospel almost like it was a box and lift the lid on it and be like, this is what's been going on. He's going to start all the way before the earth was created and go all the way through history up to where we're at and to go into the future is what Christ has not done yet. And that's going to be the first three chapters. Then he's going to move on to how that affects our physical life and work on earth. So Paul's basically like, okay, listen to what Jesus has done, so this is how you should live. And now he's not going to hold our hand too much. He's going to say these things. You're like, well, why would you say that? If you go back to chapters 1 through 3, it's always going to connect to it. What he teaches there is going to be what he kind of jumps off of in the second half of the book. So, secondly, 
He gives us a deeper understanding of how what we know about God affects or changes or leads to the way that we worship God. And so we learn these words. We have theology, what we know about God, leads to doxology, which is how we worship God. So, for example, if you see somebody, like in a church service, and they're, they can't sing worth a lick. I mean, they're just not a good singer, but man, they are going for it, right? Let's say that you talk to them, and they're like, yeah, I know I sing bad. So you have to take a step back and say, what is it that this person knows about God that would lead them just to sing their heart out and not really care about the way that other people perceive them? Right? That theology leads their doxology, right? It's not, you know, they're looking at it and going, okay, well, it's not how good I am at singing. It really has to do with what I think about God that leads to the way that I worship. Also, it's going to offer us proof of the power of the gospel. So we need proof. This is a really wicked culture. A really wicked culture. You know, religiously wicked, culturally wicked, sexually wicked, in every way. If you were to look at a list of, of cities in the old, uh, in the ancient world and said, okay, which of these is the gospel going to turn upside down? Ephesians probably is not going to make your list. You'd probably be like, okay, well, maybe Jerusalem, because they kind of share some faith there. Um, you know what? Maybe some of the other areas in Jerusalem. Or, and you're going to think about this in a very you know, worldly wisdom kind of way. But God rolls in. He's like, no. It's like the gospel of my son has power to transform any culture. And that's the, you know, it's in Ephesus that a guy says, this guy, Paul, and others like him are turning the world upside down. And finally, and I think most importantly, it's going to offer us a more intimate connection with the past. By the past, I mean past believers, because there's so much like us. I could have ripped out Ephesians and put in any modern American city, and you would have thought I was talking about an American city. A city of 250,000 people with prostitutes, a very sexual culture, with sexual say, advertising. I mean, it just screams modern day America. What, Jack? You could just say Cameron County people. I think the point is, is that when we read the Old Testament, or excuse me, well, both of them, the Old and New Testament, we feel so disconnected, as if people are different. People don't change. Only our circumstances change. Right? Like tonight, I'm going to lay down and I'm going to play Game Boy. Right? And so, like, you know, how silly would it be to say that, oh, because I have a Game Boy, I'm modern and more technologically advanced. I'm so different from the people in the New Testament who probably had their own little games and things that they were playing and probably spent their time doing a lot of the stuff that we do just change the name. We play a board game like Catan, and they're playing some kind of ancient board game that we've lost to history, right? They, they did the same things we have. They're the same social creatures, the same desires, the same wants, and the same fears that we have today. You know, for example, like, uh, like pandemics. Like, that's nothing new throughout history. Same fears, same problems. So that is why we are reading Ephesians. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's pray. That's going to be my introduction to the book. And we'll go from there. Father God, we haven't spent too much time in your work today. Lord, we're trying to set the context. We're trying to set the foundation for where we're going to go. Lord, the people of Ephesus could just as easily be us. We could have lived there and been comfortable and understood parts of the culture, even being so separated from them, Lord. Lord, we have the same problems, the same fears, the same desires, Lord, the same sinful tendencies. And we ask you for grace that we be deeply connected with your word, that we be deeply connected with the apostle that you called to write it, and that the Holy Spirit that wrote it through him would reveal it in us, and that we be changed and transformed into the image of your Son, that we be like Jesus, more like him, think more like him, speak more like him, love more like him by the time that we finish the study than we came to it. And we ask for those graces in Jesus' name. Amen.